Nice one. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for showing up. Um, I'm David from Promo Science Community. Um, and as you can see, I'm holding a microphone here as well. We're doing this hybrid, so we've got a few participants over Zoom too. Uh, and just so you know, we are recording these as well and putting them on our YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, you're not on video, Ben is a little bit, but um, just know. so you know, uh, if you'd rather for the Q&A, especially afterwards, not have your audio recorded uh, on YouTube, just come up to me and let me know and we can always uh, mute that out. That's no problem at all. So absolutely no pressure at this point, microphones. <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, thanks all for coming. So this is a um, cafe side talk. Um, we've got um, Dr. Ben Holt today. Um, he's going to tell us about rock pools. Um, the way this works is uh, Ben's going to give a presentation first, and then we're going to go into Q and A afterwards, um, where you'll have the opportunity to ask questions as well. Uh, I will be walking around for that uh, with the microphone, just so people online can hear as well. Um, yeah. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ben Holt. Um, he's been dabbling in uh, research, uh, as I heard uh, previously, and now works full time for the Rockwell project, which he is CEO and co-founder of. So Wonderful. Please, Thank you, David. Uh, thanks very much for having me along. Uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, uh, my name's Ben Holt. Um, I, I did dabble a bit in research for about 15 years or so, um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about, um, I didn't notice that that previous slide uh, it was uh, probably um, a, a ripped from a previous presentation. I'm not going to talk all about my career in marine citizen science today, but I will touch a little bit on the bits that led me to where I am now, uh, uh, the CEO of the Rockpool Project, so, which is a local not-for-profit organization, which is all about citizen science, so getting people uh, involved in the research that we do um, and uh, raising awareness and education uh, through the power of uh, the wonderful wildlife that we find in our rock pools. And uh, um, every day, as we've been out today in, here in Falmouth, uh, I've become more and more grateful uh, for how incredible the wildlife is out there. Have we, have we got any keen wild, uh, rock poolers in the room at all? No, we all don't. Well, we have to try and uh, sort that out during the talk. Um, Hello, everybody um, uh, watching at home. I hope you can hear me okay. I believe you can. So, yeah, the Rockpool Project, um, we, uh, earlier on this year, we're very much a community project and we try and involve our volunteers in everything that we do. Uh, we, ha we had a, a every, start of every year, we have an annual gathering uh, and uh, we decided to come up with a mission statement. And uh, this is what we came up with, inspiring, learning and connecting because uh, people need wildlife and wildlife means people. And that really does uh, sum up everything that we're about. Uh, when it comes to inspiration, uh, this is uh, probably the current uh, uh, favorite story of mine. Uh, this is uh, Vicky Barlow, who's uh, one of our volunteers um, who joined us through our current lottery, lottery funded project called Blue Recovery. And uh, Vicky um, joined us about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, and she hadn't really rocked before, just like yourselves uh, before. Um, uh, she, uh, she'd been involved in other um, uh, wildlife habitats, but, uh, but not rock crawling. Um, and through um, joining our community and coming along uh, on a monthly basis, um, she not only became uh, uh, fond of rock crawling, but had learned an awful lot. And now um, she's one of our rock pool safari guides uh, and takes people out and teaches them about the rock pools. Uh, and the reason why I'm mentioning her today is uh, some of you might have seen in the news uh, she discovered on uh, our, uh, um, our May uh, community event here in Falmouth, uh, this uh, incredible sea slug. Uh, it's called a, uh, uh, a rainbow sea slug. Anyone see this in the news at all? Um, so we decided after, it was the first time anyone ever found one rock pulling in the UK. It was discovered in the UK um, uh, for the first time last August uh, by divers, uh, but not been found rock pulling before. Um, it's actually found, um, elsewhere in the world, we've got a video of this one actually, which is quite a cool video, oh, both the video and the, and the, uh, um, uh, um, the, uh, the picture taken by the Keisha King photographer. Um, and yeah, absolutely stunning. It, it wasn't this size in real life. By <laughs> <way>. <laughs> it, was, it was about that size, it was only we. Uh, but um, somebody sent us a picture of one since, uh, we're not exactly sure where. This one was found in, in a place called Tunnel Beach, which is in between uh, Castle Beach and Gilly Beach. Uh, where we do a lot of our stuff. Um, somebody emailed us in once, just said it was in the foul Hel Helford area. So uh, um, it has been spotted since. Um, maybe, right, there's a good chance that um, uh, with the water temperatures rising, it, it's uh, now establishing itself here. But it's quite rarely recorded across the whole world. It's typically found in, in Portugal and Spain. Um, and, but also, there are also records from the other side of the Atlantic in the Caribbean and Brazil. 
Um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, those records uh, turn out, if they do genetic tests, maybe, maybe a different species, who knows, will look similar. Um, so it's quite rare to find generally, but um, it's, it's almost certainly a, a, a sign of the changing sea temperatures, which I won't delve into too much today, uh, but we do certainly see signs of, of that. Um, set the Rockwell project up with um, um, Alan, a good friend of mine I went to university with, studied marine biology with, um, uh, well over 20 years ago now. Um, he went off to become a primary school teacher um, and uh, I carried on in uh, the world of uh, uh, marine research or biological research. I did a lot of terrestrial stuff as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, around about 2017, um, we met up uh, and got chatting and we decided to join forces um, and set up uh, this uh, not-for-profit organisation, the Rockwell Project. The main driver from my own point of view is I've been involved in a lot of citizen science projects. I'm sure you guys probably uh, know what I mean by citizen science, getting the general public involved in collecting data. There's all sorts of different scales of citizen science, uh, from um, people just letting their computers be used by scientists to, uh, to do analysis, uh, right through to the kind of things that we do where, where we have uh, members of the public actually designing the, the, the uh, studies that we do. Um, so yeah, but I've been involved in a lot of these things um, in, my, in my career and often, particularly when they're based at universities, research institutes, they, they're grant funded, the grant runs out and the project ends. And that's a big problem when it comes to um, ecological research. A lot of this stuff, some of the projects I've worked on, we're talking about how important it is uh, to collect long-term data, uh, for, to study things like climate change. Uh, and that just doesn't happen if you've only got a two or three year long project. And my inspiration was to try and set up a, pro a project, a not-for-profit organization all by itself that brought in income. It's, we do bring in a lot of income through grants, but a lot of our income through grants, um, but also to have some, uh, some trading income. So we have ecotourism, that kind of stuff, uh, which brings in some income to keep us going, uh, even if uh, the grants don't come through. So that was in 2018. Uh, we're now, we set up in Falmouth originally, this is where I live just outside of Falmouth, uh, um, and we've uh, now expanded uh, very much to Plymouth, and we have a thriving hub uh, in the Plymouth area, and um, we'll, I'll talk in the second part of my, um, my talk today about our Blue Recovery Project, and that's been really, really helpful in terms of establishing our hub up there in, in Plymouth. So, what we're all about is Collecting data, yes, uh, but keeping it fun. Uh, I think the, uh, what I've learned a lot, um, and I'll talk a bit about this in some of the other um, research that I've done, um, is that the citizen science is kind of like a balance when it comes to um, ecological citizen science, at least. Uh, people, are, there are people out there that love going out and uh, experiencing wildlife. There are people that uh, like, their, uh, like recording the wildlife that they see. And so that's data that scientists can use. And I'd say this country, is the best in the world, literally the best when it comes to collecting wildlife data. However, it's not always necessarily usable data when it comes to answering particular questions, like how things are changing over time, how they change from place to place, um, where should we concentrate our conservation effort? It's um, it, sometimes, it, because it hasn't been collected with that in mind, um, it can be very hit and miss uh, for those kind of purposes. So. If you're setting up a citizen science program, you want to bring in a bit of standardization. But of course, then you're asking people to do something that they weren't already doing rather than something they were already doing. And the more boring you make it, the less people will actually do it. And so that is the, the big balance. Uh, and the less people do it, the less data you get. So you're not achieving your scientific goals anyway. So we try and keep things fun, uh, but, try, uh, but we also have uh, uh, what we call our biodiversity surveys. So biodiversity surveys, we just ask a set number of people, two people, to work together for a set time, either 20 minutes or 45 minutes, depending on the style of survey, uh, and look for a particular group of animals or seaweeds to make sure we've got that particular taxonomic group covered. Um, so they're still quite fun, uh, but they give us a, a, a level of standardization which makes a big difference. Across the organization, we organize ourselves into different themes. So we have education, we work uh, a lot with, uh, with schools, uh, so this is, uh, and uh, ecotourism, tourists, also uh, local people a lot, uh, um, uh, we get a lot of bookings through local people. Our ecotourism, we have a number of, uh, of safari guides um, who are based here in Falmouth and Plymouth, uh, who we train up 
uh, and they take out just small groups, typically families or two families that are friends, um, and, uh, um, or we do have adult groups that go out as well um, and, uh, and take people out and, and introduce them to the wildlife, but also everything we do, we record the wildlife as well. Citizen science, I'll talk about that at the end, uh, and the community work as well. So I mentioned the balance. I'm trying to sort of balance myself in terms of being on camera and not being in your way. I don't know how well it's going to work. Maybe I'll stand there. That might work. Um, the, when it comes to asking people to do stuff that they don't want to do so you can get better quality data, um, we believe very much that this loop, citizen science loop, is very important. So a lot of citizen science programs, um, we ask the public to just go out and collect data and then that's it. They never hear anything back, basically. They don't know what happens to that data. Um, so we want to sort of complete the loop by saying people have got an interest, they take part in an activity, we'll ask them to upload the data. So every time uh, someone takes part in an activity, they, we ask them to take a photograph of every species that they uh, find in, yeah, that's uh, required by the activity and that gets uploaded. Um, and then that uh, will get analyzed, um, both in terms of looking at our own analysis uh, for, for answering questions, but also um, looking at how the person's progressing, how many different species are they finding, um, what's special about the species they found, was it the first time it's been found at that site this year or ever, first time it's ever been found in the Rockwell project, and they'll get a, uh, a feedback form which looks a bit like, well, oops. This is an old one that we've got here, uh, which gives them all of that information along with the pictures that they find to try and rekindle that interest and, uh, and make sure that it's not just a, a one-way street with them providing stuff to us. Uh, so th these are the kind of lessons that I've learned over my career, um, starting off, um, well, I'll explain in a minute, um, as a person that just analysed the data uh, and then getting much more involved in the ground uh, uh, with the organisations collecting the data. So how did I get here? I, it was actually these incredible fish that got me into where I am standing now. <laughs> um, does anyone that you can see, it's got the, uh, the uh, scientific name of these fish at the top there. Any, anybody know what these fish are called? They're called hamlets, okay? And they're found in, and my PhD uh, was uh, all about these fish, okay? And I was chatting to Emily about her PhD. Uh, this gives me, it's, it's a long time ago now, um, but uh, it, it, it takes me right back. I still love these fish and I still hate these fish. <laughs> <laughs> I spent four years studying these fish and found out pretty much nothing, basically. <laughs> but uh, very, very interesting fish. These, uh, there's many things that are interesting, but what you're seeing this, in this picture is beautiful pictures from Alex Mustard. Uh, these are two, uh, I think they're golden hamlets, but I could be wrong. Um, they are mating, they're spawning, okay? Now, there's something very special about this particular species of fish. Um, it's, it's what's called a simultaneous hermaphrodite. Uh, many species of coral reef fish, these guys are found throughout the Caribbean. Uh, change from uh, male to female or female to male uh, as part of their life cycle. Not any vertebrates at all um, are male and female throughout their entire life cycle, but these fish are. And what they do is they have a, a spawning behavior called uh, egg trading. So the individual that donates the eggs uh, and acts as the female in the uh, relationship um, is losing out because they're actually, yeah, it takes a lot more food and energy and resources to produce eggs than it does sperm. And so they say, there is some research behind it, but it's not uh, exactly rock solid, that they, they actually reciprocate. So they check each other out uh, and then uh, they, they make like this. That wasn't what my, uh, my PhD was about. My PhD was about the fact that there's so many different colors of them and they're actually classified as different species to this day. But at the start, of, well, prior to my PhD, people did genetic work and found that really, in, in, in simple terms, they're not different species in the slightest, okay? They couldn't, they could barely be more closely related. My, one part of my PhD was to find some area of the genome that actually distinguished which color was which, and I failed, and, no, and nobody has actually succeeded since. I suppose that's uh, um, some kind of consolation. Um, but it's very interesting because the idea is that perhaps they could be the early stages of becoming new species. 
Uh, and this is something that's not well understood. Um, talk about uh, Darwin and the origin of the species, didn't really discuss too much about how species are, originate. How does one lineage split into two or more lineages? It spoke, talk a lot about how a lineage will evolve over time. Um, part of the reason why it's not so well understood is it either happened millions of years ago um, or it hasn't happened basically. So if you've got an example that seems to be happening right now, then it was quite exciting. But uh, yeah, that's, but what we did find out, thanks to uh, data from these people, this is a map that I produced here. Um, this is the Reef, the, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. They are a citizen science organization. And I use their data to, to study the distributions of these species. They are found throughout the Caribbean, but not all of them are found all throughout the Caribbean. Some are found in very specific spots and some others. And I was able to use data collected by thousands upon thousands of scientists to uh, uh, establish that they are non-random in terms of how they interact with each other. And this is perhaps a clue about how they might have originated. Um, there's a good chance in my book that they're not actually diverging into different species, that they're actually quite stable as they are. But at the end of it, so I produced a paper from that and um, yeah, took, had a few rejections and stuff. We got there in the end. <laughs> and um, I thought it was pretty cool uh, that, uh, not necessarily my paper, but the fact that we've learned so much about these fish out of the efforts that all these thousands of people have, have put in for absolutely nothing. Um, the organization themselves uh, have, have been going since the 90s. Um, it's quite interesting um, and a, an example of, of why citizen science, I know they're going since the 90s. Um, it's really the turn of the century where they've really sort of taken off and that's when they went completely online. Previous to that, everyone had to sort of fill in a form, scan form and post it off. Um, uh, so yeah, they've been uh, extremely successful. This uh, lady who I got, I was lucky enough, she's been in my talks for years, Cheryl Shea she's called. She's a, 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 a uh, a winner of the Golden Hamlet, or a member of the Golden Hamlet Club. It's just a massive coincidence that they have Hamlets uh, as, as their awards for their top surveyors. But uh, I suppose it's not a huge coincidence because they're beautiful fish. Um, she's completed over a thousand surveys, or had many years ago. She's done a lot more now. Um, completely free of charge. Uh, a huge amount of very valuable data. Um, and it's difficult to uh, uh, put a price on, on the value of that incredible uh, work. And there's a few people uh, in their organization that have put in that level of effort. So having done that work, um, I uh, uh, completed my PhD and I decided that I was gonna carry on working uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the data that these guys had actually put together and not just study Hamlets, amazing though they are, annoying though they are, um, I was going to study, have a look at all fish species. When they go diving, they don't just record hamlets. They record any fish species that they see. Um, and this is a measure of how many survey sites they've got. Uh, and I tried to, well, I did analyze um, the, the data to see where there were uh, high diversity areas and where there were low diversity areas. And this map, first map um, of, of uh, uh, fish biodiversity in this, in, of this nature in the Caribbean uh, showed that this was the case. It's quite, um, it's quite telling. Um, with a data set like this, um, there's challenges in terms of, well, you can see here, anyone know where that is in the Caribbean? Dutch Antilles is correct, yes. In fact, this bright, uh, uh, very diverse uh, island here is, is Bonaire, um, which is, it's a scuba diver's paradise. Um, and I can tell you, um, it, I mean, I've, been, I've been there, like literally every hotel is a scuba diving hotel. Um, it is as well as being, according to uh, uh, my research, the most diverse area, has the most recorded species, uh, it's also by far, not by far, but it is the most uh, surveyed in, the, in this data set as well. And the, the survey effort throughout the data set varies hugely. There's a few sites which are here that have been surveyed 500 times. There are many sites that have only been surveyed once or twice. And obviously that affects the patterns that you see. So we had to uh, um, try and uh, adjust for that in the analysis, pretty confident in what we did. And it still came up as being uh, the most diverse area. We also had a um, hotspot of diversity in the Florida Keys as well. Um, different, uh, slightly different composition of, of species up there. Um, so, managed to publish this paper as well and had a look not just at, no, I wasn't just producing the map, trying to explain it as well. And the, the main take home finding 
um, is that the, the biggest exp uh, explanatory variable uh, that we have, though there's a big proviso there, the biggest that we have, because there's a lot of data that we wish we had, but we don't have. Um, but the biggest explaining variable was temperature, basically. And the interesting thing about the relationship that we saw with temperature and fish diversity, when I'm saying fish diversity, uh, we're talking ab about a thing called species richness. It's just the number of species in a particular location. Um, the thing about the temperature is that it wasn't the hottest reefs. So these places here are not actually the hottest reefs in the Caribbean uh, that had the highest diversity. If it was cold, there were not many fish. Um, and if it was really, really hot, there weren't so many fish either. It sort of went up and then went down. Um, and so quite interesting uh, that uh, uh, that was the case. Um, and we sorry, ahead of myself there. Uh, and we sort of speculated as to why that might work. One potential explanation um, that fits is that the sort of that peak temperature for fish biodiversity was around 27 degrees. Uh, and above that tends to be the temperature where corals themselves will bleach. Um, and coral bleaching is one of the m big threats to coral reef habitats in the, in the region. So it could be not just a direct impact of the temperature on the fish, uh, but, um, but of their habitat themselves. So I did a lot of work with their data. Um, and I also, I haven't uh, mentioned it today, I also did some studies in the field um, with uh, some students. I was a, a lecturer for... Uh, um, an organization called the School for Field Studies in the Turks and Caicos for a year. We did um, a, uh, a good fun study looking at their survey methods. The survey methods, I'll briefly mention, basically uh, mean the, the, the methodology is you, you put your scuba gear, gear on, you go under the water, you record every fish you see, and you come out, basically. So it's, like I say, not really changing what people do too much. Um, that puts a lot of noise in the data, but it gave up that huge data set. There's an equivalent, uh, well, a rival organization called Reef Check in the region. They um, are much more structured. You have to put down a, um, a transit tape um, and you have to do a certain time. You go with your buddy um, and you do three of them. You have to do like two days training, that kind of thing. So you get the same. No one does it <laughs> by, by comparison, I should say. Some people do do it. But I mean, these guys have, have recorded like hundreds, hundreds of thousands of records, not reef check. And they've got a lot more money behind them as well. So, um, so the lesson is that these guys can help us learn about the environment, but also that fun protocols can be used. Uh, but there are problems I mentioned about the survey effort varying. That's a big one. Um, we also had a look at um, how much records vary between individuals. Uh, and that is a big problem. People often talk about uh, when they know um, uh, that I'm, I'm into citizen science data, like can you really trust the data that people are collecting? And it's, it's far more complicated than just saying that the public don't know what they're talking about, basically. Quite often, um, these guys know a lot more than academics when it comes to natural history, because they, a, a, a lot of these people are really, really uh, naturalists. So they, they, and a lot of academics don't have the time to actually put into really getting their field ID skills up. So it's not as simple as that. The, the problem is the variation, basically. Um, and a lot of that will make some noise in the data, which can be fixed. These guys, um, they divide their data set into amateur and um, expert data. And you have to do like 30 surveys and, and a couple of fish ID exams. And that gave me the opportunity to, uh, to compare the two data set, or set two and, and compare it. There was some, some good consistency between the two data sets, actually. It depends if you look for uh, the problems or the, uh, or the consistency. Right? But the key thing for me was it was a fun method and it gave us lots of data and we could do stuff and find stuff out. So I did that work um, at a place called um, the Centre for Macroecology, um, Evolution and Climate. Um, in, in Denmark, um, because uh, I had a, a European fellowship, uh, I called this at the time, it was called Maricure Fellowship. Uh, fantastic opportunity, not available, unfortunately, to uh, our researchers now, uh, to move researchers uh, through uh, EU countries. Um, and those guys uh, were brilliant and, re and really taught me how to uh, do a lot of the analysis there. They also um, got, well, uh, gave me the opportunity to get, to get involved in drill stuff. Um, Anyone know who this is? Don't say Darwin. 
This is Alfred Russell Wallace, okay, uh, the uh, co-discoverer uh, uh, of uh, evolution by natural, uh, well, credited uh, with uh, being the co-discoverer of uh, evolution by natural selection. And one of the things that um, he did many, many years ago now, uh, in the uh, sort of mid to late uh, uh, 19th century, was to draw a map of the world like this, according to the animals that lived there. Uh, using the research that was available at the time, he divided the world into these six regions. Um, and at, uh, at SMEC, as they call it, SMEC, I don't know what, uh, I know what it stands for, because I just said it, but uh, apparently it's a rude word in Danish, but uh, I don't know what that means, <laughs> probably for the best. Um, they had a, a fantastic data set, um, if I show you on the next page, um, of all of the uh, um, of amphibians, mammals, and birds in the world, as well as evolutionary trees uh, for, uh, uh, for those groups. And I led a, uh, uh, a project to, to redraw Wallace's map, and that's what we did. Um, and it was fantastic, and um, it, it's, what, a, what a fantastic resource. This has been produced by the IUCN, the, 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 the um, distribution data that, uh, for these guys. Um, a, a great resource. People say to me, uh, because I know from, I'm a marine back, why am I doing it for the oceans? Uh, well, why didn't I do it for the oceans? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is an old paper, admittedly, so it is out of date, but uh, it still illustrates a, a problem which is uh, uh, slightly improved, but uh, um, still a major problem when it comes to knowing what wildlife is out there in the oceans. Okay. And I think it's a fantastic, very, uh, very nice. So what this map shows is fish species, similar to my map in the Caribbean, actually, except in seven, seven points that they've divided the world's oceans up into grids. Okay. And each grid, the color of the grid, doesn't show the diversity of fish in that grid. It shows how well we know the fish species in that grid. Okay. So if it's green, as our grid here, I say our grid, we're sharing it with uh, um, in Northwest Africa there, um, is quite green. So we know pretty much 100% of the fish species that live there, okay? Um, there are some grids out there in the world, or there were back then, that are red. So only 1% of the fish that are there um, have actually been recorded. I can tell you later if you want how they work that out. Uh, but the very interesting thing for me now these two up here and here, down there and up there, um, not a single record of any fish at that time in this 36 degree grid square. Massive, massive area, okay? So that's an idea of how packed the kind of data and how little we know about Much more uh, dramatic when you start to sort of zoom in, okay? These grids are far too big to really do much with in terms of find out anything about how the world's diversity works, in terms of prioritizing conservation um, across the world. We need to have smaller grid squares. And they looked at it um, as with smaller grid squares. And the more you zoom in, the more white you get. So many parts of the, of the world's ocean that we just don't know anything. And this is for fish. That's the group that we know the most about when it comes to, and it's just one very small component, really, of all of, of the uh, biological diversity that we get in the oceans. So there's a lot to find out and not a lot of resources out there to, to, to get to the bottom of it all. So citizen science can help that. And I think it's really the only way forward. We can raise public awareness using citizen science, but we can also raise those, uh, resolve those data gaps. And that's what we're up to with the Rockpool project. And I'm gonna speak a, a bit now about our, uh, um, as you saw at the start, we've been going for five years, but things have changed a lot over the last two years, thanks to uh, the National Lottery Heritage Fund uh, and this big community project that we've been running um, since the beginning of 2022. Um, we have been connecting communities here in Falmouth and in, in, uh, in Plymouth uh, for, with our local beaches through monthly beach events. And on these beach events, um, if you're available, um, I've got some details to take away, please do come, uh, come along. We will divide groups initially into citizen scientists and fan groups, and that now enables us to tailor our activities to, uh, um, to those different groups. Uh, and then we bring everyone together um, 
focusing on that fun aspect that I mentioned at the beginning. And uh, we've actually developed um, our Rockpool Battle apps. So these are, are, are becoming very, very uh, competitive and, uh, and very much enjoyed. So we have uh, a battle between two or three groups uh, of people. Uh, and what you do is you record everything you find, literally any species that you find, and every single species will give you a score, depending on how common that or rare that species is. Um, and, uh, and then we have a big celebration at the end of season as well. So that's fun, and we're looking to uh, create communities for it. I mentioned that. We, during the first year, we focused mostly on training our citizen scientists, and towards the end of the first year, um, we actually developed with our citizen scientists our, our focus for this year, and I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, we've had uh, lots of people taking part, so we've already smashed all of our uh, targets for the project. Um, as you see, we're a bit ahead of Plymouth in terms of uh, participation. <laughs> they, they will claim that I've cherry-picked this particular stat because uh, they're doing well in other ways as well. Um, one thing that I found uh, particularly pleasing because uh, there isn't um, any, well, there isn't a lot of existing information on this. There's a lot of, of information about how connecting to nature is good for health and well-being. Um, and there's a lot of information uh, produced by some fantastic scientists that live down here, actually, are based down here, um, uh, looking at how being close to the ocean is, is good for health and well-being. When it comes to, is rock pulling good for health and well-being, uh, there's less information. We collect the data before and after uh, people have come out with us. And on this uh, plot here, you can see each dot on the left-hand side represents a person which is connected to a dot on the right hand side, which is the same person. And how high or lower it is depends that, um, on how high or low they, they rank themselves in terms of uh, a few um, questions about their health and well-being. And we've demonstrated that uh, aside from free people that obviously didn't enjoy themselves too much. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a diverse world out there. Some people don't like things, I don't know why. But anyway, um, they... Um, we have a, a very significant uh, result here in terms of, of people uh, um, getting a lot just out of a single session. We, we believe that the real benefit is just keeping it, keeping time uh, back and getting into it. And that's what we're, we're, we're encouraging. Uh, so there's one quote uh, from uh, somebody who took part. Uh, uh, it's, it's all encompassing when you are rock falling and it's, it's uh, great for taking your mind away from life's other stresses. And I couldn't uh, 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 agree with that anymore, really. I think it's, uh, uh, I feel quite therapeutic. I have occasions when I've been feeling down about something or other, um, just decide I'm just going to go off rock pulling. And uh, it, it's something to do with a calming environment and being close to the sea, but also just a, a, a nice natural focus of just discovering things, turning over rocks. Um, it takes your mind of, of, of everything else. So uh, I can definitely recommend it uh, uh, for health and well-being. And you find some cool stuff. So I've got the... Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the rainbow sea slug here. Um, anyone? So you guys are not rock. Does anyone recognise anything here at all? All of these are now for you in our uh, blue recovery uh, beach project. Emily, at all? Put know. you on the spot. <laughs> okay. Is the starfish a Yeah, good one. So uh, this is a um, quite a, a favourite. This is the most common type of. Uh, Starfish that we find, they're quite a new starfish actually, because uh, they're called cushion stars. Um, they're, they're typically found underneath rocks, uh, but um, and most starfish are usually on top of rocks, but they're only little, so uh, maybe that's why they tend to, tend to hide underneath here. This is another uh, local favorite. Wait, I'm guessing you might know it's a hermit crab. Have you guys heard of St. Piran's hermit crab at all? Yeah, so you knew that already. Pardon? They do still have peach shells. And, uh, well, I mean, they, they still have a hermit crab shell. So they won't actually oust the original uh, uh, owner of the shell from it. So they'll leave that to other bigger crabs. Um, these, I mean, this has been a species which has been fascinating over the last five years of we've been collecting data. You know, when we first started the Rockwell project, St. Perrin's hermit crab was a new thing. It only just been, it only just returned to these shores. It was just, but at Castle Beach here um, about six or seven years ago by um, people on another uh, project. Um, and yeah, I and mean, when we started, like if we found one, we like to tell, it, tell everybody on the internet. <laughs> now, I mean, like it's, it's actually more common than the common hermit crab here in Falmouth. It's uh, um, all over the place. And that's 
another sign of global warming. It really is because uh, uh, they are they're moving, or well, they have moved over from France. How are we doing for time? All right. Um, so just uh, um, a little bit of uh, further stuff about the stuff that we've been up to. So um, last year, we collected a whole bunch of data, about 300 odd surveys, I think, um, across these different types. This um, bioblitz of the more fun type, which is uh, sort of uh, less usable data. Uh, also the Rockwell Bingo, we do that with the kids quite a lot. Uh, these are the, the biodiversity surveys. So in our project last year, we were concentrating mostly on training. We didn't collect so much of the uh, more rigorous data. That's changing this year, or has changed already this year. Um, first, 366 surveys in total, over 6,000 species records, and 303 species. So there's a lot out there, basically, and we are constantly finding new stuff. So um, even though we've been collecting data for five years, um, we got uh, uh, 36 new species um, uh, uh, to our database last year, including uh, these three, all found by our new um, citizen scientists. And as I mentioned, we are now focusing everybody's new skills um, um, in, in a particular direction. And that direction uh, wasn't decided by us or by me, basically, uh, it was uh, decided as a community. So the, the um, people from Plymouth and uh, um, came together uh, in neutral territory in uh, Lost Gwyrville. Uh, and uh, we, uh, Lost Gwyrville Community Center there. Um, and we had a big sort of brainstorming session of like just what and just check any ideas out. What can we actually study? Uh, what's in, of interest to you? We also considered, you know, what, what's important to you as well. So that helped guide our thinking. And at the end of the session, we came up with all sorts of different things, basically. Um, sewage impacts, uh, ocean um, uh, acidification and climate change we put together. Um, some people said about looking to see if we can have positive impacts, this kind of thing. Climate change came up again. Um, and from there, we had an online vote. We opened it up to the general public and just uh, said, yeah, which of these uh, uh, can actually, uh, do you think we should go for? So we wanted to involve the public. Uh, we actually decided amongst ourselves to involve the rest of the public um, so we can try and get some more people involved. Um, and this was the result of the poll. Uh, and you can see there that I've, I've already ordered them uh, in, uh, uh, in order. Uh, sewage impact was the thing that came out as top. But we decided that we weren't just going to automatically take the top one. Um, the reason being is that anybody on their phone or on their computer can click to support anyone needs without having to think too much about is it actually possible to do or not basically so we decided we'd take the top three uh, and we had an, uh, an online meeting um, and we had uh, three of our, uh, our most sort of trusted uh, uh, team members who uh, are doing PhDs in Plymouth and here and, and uh, one of them moved up to Durham present those three ideas and really have a good look at uh, whether we'd be able to do it or not and at the end of all that, we had a vote there and then, and sewage impact came out as being a hot topic. So that's what we are researching this year, uh, the impact of sewage on our wildlife. And it's not surprising because it's a topic about this. Um, for me, I've, got, I've still got an open mind, at least down here in Falmouth, features that I know, uh, and I know exactly where the uh, location of the sewage pipe is. I don't know if you can see it very well here, but this is Christoph's slide, I think, here. Um, just on the uh, southern side of Gilly Beach is where uh, um, the, the main outlet pipe is uh, for, this, uh, for this particular area where we are. Um, and that was, uh, that's filled uh, 40 times last year, which is uh, um, pretty disgusting. And, uh, uh, and everybody's uh, uh, very angry about it. But in all, uh, in all truth, uh, when it comes to the, the wildlife, I'm not sure if there's going to be any impact or not, but uh, um, if just, there isn't, uh, there's a question of, of just whether there, um, we just don't know. We don't really know too much about the water itself, as it turns out. I didn't appreciate this fully um, when um, I started down this. It's not an area that I've really worked in closely before. Um, the Environment Agency do monitor the water quality um, um, at Gilly Beach, um, but according to their websites it was uh, surveyed i think about seven times last year maybe eight times uh, their water collection point is on the other side of the beach to where the, the sewage pipe is uh, um, if that's too big a problem uh, my, we've collected samples now we're still waiting for the results but 
I, I wouldn't be too surprised if it just goes out and it's spread around the whole base pretty much straight away anyway. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's not showing that there's uh, too much of an issue. There might not be an issue. I don't even know if Southern Water know how much of an issue there is. They know, they report when it's filling and they report when it's stopped. Um, hopefully we'll find out a bit about that and how it can be, what we're looking at specifically is, does it change the species that we find? Uh, and we've been um, undertaking just uh, this right now, actually, um, we've started our first survey period um, uh, looking at all of those these sites, all the way from the sewage pipe, all the way across to the other side of, of, of Castle Beach, recording particular groups of species, and we'll be analysing to see if they change. And after that, the July survey period, we'll be looking at limpets, uh, certain types of mollusks, which have been shown in other, uh, from other researchers to be either positively or negatively affected by sewage. Um, and we're going to be quantifying them uh, using things called quadrats, uh, a bit more specifically. So please do feel free to, uh, to, to get involved with that. Um, just to explain a little bit more about uh, the approach, this is um, a map that I produced. Um, you might you know, just be able to work out, this is it's found up here. These um, yellow blobs are our survey sites. The orange blobs are um, the locations of the sewage outlet points, uh, which has uh, provided by the British Government Trust. We've got a fantastic map um, for, with the locations and, and also data associated with how many times they've spilled. And I just made this, uh, um, this green coloration based on the distance of each point um, from where it is to the nearest uh, sewage point. And so the idea is, this is the, called the Queen Mary Pumping House um, outlet. Uh, we've been sur surveying all of these ones here. We might get to this one here uh, and seeing how it changes. Um, the, the benefit of doing it that way and getting a whole range of sites across the gradient um, is hopefully shown by, if we look at um, this hypothetical example of, of limpet abundance, which is based on Australian paper, um, they looked at limpet abundance associated with uh, distance from sewage, um, and they showed a relationship but it wasn't, wasn't like this, basically. What it was like, is similar to um, my fish that I mentioned earlier, it was a hump-shaped relationship, okay? So if we only, uh, if these guys had only done two sites, then they would, might have said there was nothing going on in terms of the impact of the sewage. But what it seems to be uh, that at intermediate levels, the sewage is potentially good for the uh, limpets, probably because there's lots of nutrients in the water, more certain types of seaweed, perhaps it's seaweed that uh, um, is more digestible um, to, the, to the limpets. Um, but then at very close proximity, perhaps there are chemicals or, or other pollutants in the water, uh, which uh, are in negatively influencing the, uh, the limpets. And because they studied a range of, of, of sites, uh, of distances from the, the uh, sewage outlet, they were able to pick that out. So hopefully we might be able to find if that sort of thing's going there. We don't really know should be told if the sewage pollution, even though it looks anything like this, even, this is just distance from those pipes. Uh, and we are collecting, and we have been collecting uh, um, samples before and during um, the reported spills uh, to try and get some better data on that. Let's get through this bit here. Okay. I think we have given on the other stuff that we do. And as I say, it's very, very important in terms of our rock pool, uh, our ecotourism uh, to, to bring in, keep bringing in um, um, regular income to support our project. Uh, we have um, uh, information on this on, on our website. So if you want to tell us to take you out rock pooling and introduce some of these amazing uh, uh, things, then we'd be very, very glad to. Also to mention that uh, we uh, have now developed a Local, for local people, they're quite often interested in, in birthday parties for young children, and we've started doing that as well. But yeah, feel free to get involved. The best place to get involved um, is on one of our, our monthly community beach days, which is completely free. Uh, um, for, um, well, completely free for anyone, but they, there's priority uh, places uh, for, for local people here in, in Falmouth. Um, so if you'd like to get involved in that, Go to our, uh, our website or drop me an email um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get you signed up uh, and you can join us at the next beach day, uh, which we do all the way through them at the Princess Pavilion and then go to Tunnel Beach from there. And that's about it from me. So thank you very much for uh, your time. And uh, yeah, uh, if anyone's got any questions, please do far away.
Thanks so much, Ben. Really enjoyed that. Oh, okay. Yeah, and really cool to see um, West Country Rivers Trust having a mention. We actually had them here last month. Oh, cool. So All it's right. really cool to see data being shared. And we're, yeah, we're, I mean, we've been in touch with them. And um, I'd very much, I mean, these guys have been looking at these kind of, um, and getting citizen scientists uh, collecting data yeah. on, on water quality and, and, uh, and water pollution for, for a long time now. Uh, and that, I think they're looking to spread it across the whole of the UK with the Rivers Trust. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, I'd be keen to sort of join them and see them how, how they do it because uh, it's it's not straightforward. Basically, yeah, there's yeah, all yeah. sorts of different things you can uh, um, you can survey for, um, and some of them work well with citizen scientists, some less so. And uh, yeah, there's a, it's yeah. complicated. But, Always a balance. Yes, well, exactly. Yeah. So, um, have we got any questions for Ben in the room, or if anyone online has questions, just put them in the chat. And we'll get to them. Go ahead, Emma. So. Um, Thanks, I'm originally from the north coast here in Cornwall, okay. and we have a big problem with um, sargassum muticum uh -huh. overtaking our rock pools. Yeah. What? What? What's your experience with that? Because it's, it's invasive, right? Yeah. Is there anything we can do about it? As well, big question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and um, if, if anyone's not familiar with uh, Sargassum muticum, uh, it's also called wireweed. Um, it's an invasive species of seaweed, which actually first arrived in the UK in the 70s um, in, uh, in the Isle of Wight uh, and didn't really do anything for a long period of time. Um, I think when I first moved down to Cornwall, which is about eight years ago, um, it was really starting to become a problem then. Um, and now it's just well known. If, if, if I take you down to the beach now, I don't know what the tide's doing now, actually. But, uh, if, if, <laughs> I should know. My, the moon controls my life. Um, yeah, the tide's, uh, the tide's probably just going out now. We'd, we'd see uh, rock pools full of wireweed, basically. Um, and I, I should imagine the big turning point would have been when it was able to survive the winter. It does die off um, a lot in the winter, but not so much now. I mean, like, I was seeing a lot of it over the winter. Um, negative impacts. Um, the best research that's been done on it has been from uh, more sub southern Europe areas because it invaded southern Europe first. It comes from uh, uh, season in Japan originally. Um, and people haven't really been able to show any sort of negative impacts from it on the local wildlife. Um, people have been, it looks like it must be because it just fills up the rock pools. Um, and it, I think, uh, we, when I was uh, previous to the Rockwell Project working at the Marine Biological Association, um, one of the aspects of that citizen science project was trying to look at the impacts. It, it was just a difficult thing to do, really. I think the best way to do it would be to physically remove it um, uh, rather than comparing rock pools with it and without it, because there's probably a reason already, a natural reason. So, um, so the jury is out on that. Uh, in terms of what you can do about it, I don't I honestly don't think you can do anything about it um, because the part of the reason why I think it spreads so well, it, it's got these little reproductive nodules all over it. You put it out of the water and they just go everywhere. Uh, and so uh, um, I would say uh, you're better off leaving it alone, but it doesn't, it doesn't really make much difference, I'm afraid. It's, it's depressingly familiar tale with, with many uh, invasive species. Uh, um, the big one in the Caribbean where I used to work is there's lionfish. And that. Yeah. They have a lot of um, uh, invasive this, this fish called lionfish in, introduced from the pet trade. Um, it's just taken over the whole region. And they have like derbies, people like hunting them and, and eating them. Uh, but they're still there. And then it's, uh, in the marine environment, there's, it's even more hard than, than in terrestrial environments to control these things, I'm afraid. Thank you. Is it the warmth of uh, the rock pool that creates more diversity with the sea, you know, with seaweeds and with animals? That's a good question. Um, the the rock pool habitat, um, when it comes to temperature uh, and all sorts of other environmental variables, is, is very, very special. Uh, and the reason why it's special is because it changes so much in such short periods of time. So um, across the year, a rock pool could get to below freezing even like seawater can go below freezing in the winter uh, and get to over 40 degrees in the summer um, so there's that variability in the year but even within a day with the tide coming in and out you get the same thing with salinity um, you know rock can pretty much dry up and be like really really saline or it can be a heavy rainstorm so all of these animals have had to to, to deal with this uh, for, for millions and millions of years um, but temperature can 
change um, the distributions of species of the seen with the uh, um, with the St. Piran's hermit crab. Um, in terms of the diversity, which is your, your exact question, it it depends on what sort of scale you're looking at. If if you're asking, um, yeah, would a uh, a warm rock pool be more diverse than a cold rock pool, or if you're saying if if the Cornwall is going to be more diverse than uh, than the north of England, so it means Cornwall is more diverse. That probably is uh, because it has warmer uh, water temperatures and also its its location as well. Um, on that on a rock pool by rock pool scale, um, it will definitely be very similar to the fish. There'll be an upper limit that most species can tolerate, and beyond that, the diversity will will drop off basically. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the room? Please go ahead. So I just wondered what sort of activity that you do would be the best one for introducing my eight-year-old grandchildren. To well, we're, we're very lucky uh, when it comes to um, our, our family activities. So because the family activities are designed for families with, with um, primary school age children. And Alan, who I mentioned at the start, set the project up with me, he is a primary school teacher. So um, every month um, he will design a new activity um, to do it. So uh, we've had a lot of activities looking at for various different groups, um, how they vary from high shore to mid shore to low shore, which is the, uh, the, the great thing about rock pools is that you will find different habitats as you walk down the beach because high up the beach is out the water most of the time, low down the beach is under the water most of the time. Um, so we uh, look a lot at that. The last, um, um, last month we had a, a hermit crab activity. Uh, I wasn't involved in it myself, so I'm trying to remember the exact. I remember they were looking at different species, two different species, and then to come uh, and looking at the shells that they were in. And um, the cool thing is that um, um, Ari Drummond, um, who's based up in, in Plymouth, she's doing her PhD on this exact thing, the, the hermit crab species, and she's uh, um, very much involved in, in the project and designing that, that study. So we're keeping it very uh, um, as closely linked to uh, what we're doing scientifically as possible. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's great. And I think one of the coolest things for me, having been here now for like five years or so, is when I meet kids that got involved quite early and I can see that they're still out there rock pulling and, and like really, really into it. Um, yeah, it just makes me feel like, well, doing something right with, with, with some kids. That's really good to hear. <laughs> yeah. uh, and on that note as well, can I ask? So I like rock pulling, but for me, that's just looking at a rock pool and being like, oh yeah, this is cool. Mm -hmm. But how can I actually go to knowing what species that they are and remembering these things. And well, I mean, come along on our Blue Recovery Beach days and uh, we'll get you up to date. Um, get a guidebook is uh, right. the key thing. Um, we've got some, uh, we've got a page on our website in terms of a, a rock pulling guide um, with basic practical advice, um, which um, is like complete entry level. So, I mean, one of the first things I say to people when they talk about like, how should we go rock pulling is I say to them, get on the internet and see when the tide is out because I swear that some people come to me and they say oh I think there's nothing there and I, I'm like are you sure you went when the tide was out and like oh I didn't really pay too much attention to that it's like no, that's very important and uh, also uh, it's not just is it in or out the, the tides they alternate between neap tides and spring tides uh, go when it's a spring tide um, where it's a, either a, a just been a, a full moon or a new moon uh, the, the tide will go out a lot further uh, and you'll see a lot more stuff when you go rock pulling. Mm. So uh, um, there's there's a few little things which we can't take for granted because we, we live and breathe it, but, yeah. um, but most people don't know. So uh, um, if they definitely get yourself a guidebook. There's some fantastic guidebooks out now. Um, and um, I can recommend some. We've got some uh, reviewed on our website as well. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Nice, thanks. Uh, anyone else know? Back to my long list. Okay. <laughs> The um, so I guess it's really interesting to me, because uh, I'm an academic as well, how you went through academia mm -hmm. and then decided, well, now mainly do citizen science from a different angle. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, what's your um, kind of relationship with academic research now? Do you collaborate with universities a lot on these things as well? You've been mentioning PhD students involved in your projects and things like that. Yeah, so we do. Um, so um, I'm, at, I'm on Pemberley campus quite a, a lot and, and work a lot with, with students, PhD students, master's students and uh, undergraduate students. Um, 
uh, I mean, it's, it's still very much a part of who, who I am. And I think it's a, a big part of, of the Rockwell project uh, generally because uh, like people like uh, uh, Christoph Patterson and, and Laura Coles who came into our project when they were doing their masters, they're now doing their PhDs. They're also directors of the project as well. Um, so it's very much in, in our DNA to have that close link uh, with um, ac academia and academic research. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's important. Um, there are um, citizen science programs that don't necessarily have that link. Um, but I think it's important in terms of having some thought about where that data is going to go and what you use it for and, uh, prior to collecting it. Um, so yeah, hopefully that will, that will continue, I'm sure it will. Yeah, yeah, sounds great. And I also really liked how you even just develop the research questions together with the community as well, like going to the other scale of things. So yeah, it's the first like time we've done that. Uh, and um, it's, it's been great and it's, it's really useful in terms of getting people involved because you know, if you decide it uh, together, then, then, uh, then you hope that people actually get out there and uh, want to actually collect some samples when a sewage outlet yeah. is, uh, is, is flowing. Uh, and they have been helpful in that respect. So uh, yeah, so it, it, it's been good, uh, not straightforward as well, but um, it's been great. I hope you're not encouraging people to bathe in the sewage while- <laughs> no, no, far from it. I did end up in there myself because I, I, I uh, had to collect a sample. Um, the guys who were testing the water for us up in, in Plymouth, they said, oh, can you get one, like a worst case scenario yeah. one? So uh, <laughs> I was like, okay, I can do that. And they're, they're, they're said, I've got to go out when, it's, when there's an alert on, so surface against sewage, yeah. uh, if you, uh, uh, if you do some in the seas here, get the surface against sewage app. It'll tell you when there's a sewage still happening. And my plan was, because I'm a paddleboarder, I'll go out on my paddleboard, put the sample tube on the end of my paddle, and then just put it in uh, and then pull it out. Um, but these things only happen when the weather is terrible, basically. <laughs> and it didn't really work out like that. I, I was straight out and uh, in the shower on there and getting finished. But I got the sample. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very <laughs> very yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, the citizen scientists yeah. weren't interested. <laughs> Have we got any last quick question for them? Hello, Sue. I didn't see you there. You've been yeah, there the whole I time. I got no, I was late because of the traffic. Yeah, you're not the only one that's uh, yeah. out there, isn't it? How the well being thing, are you still yes. doing that? The yes, well being, yeah. and have you got any connections with the what the EI? The guys in Trivo, yeah, who, the, whose acronym is too confusing e to remember. <laughs> yes, the blue and green. The, the ECEH8. Well, anyway, the, 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 those cool people in Truro that, that do the research. Yeah, they're doing all the green and blue um, well being stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I've. I've um, I'm glad you mentioned it because um, well, I have worked closely with them um, in the past. They were very, very helpful. We had, uh, were involved in their smart line projects um, and uh, uh, that was instrumental really in helping us get the funding that we did from, from the lottery. Um, but yeah, we, we need to go back to them with this side of it. I'm not going to try and publish that, I don't think, the data that I showed there, um, just because I'm very aware that we clicked the data and uh, we, we wanted those results to look good. But uh, um, I, I think it'd be nice to take it to them and then um, ask them to do a, a follow-on study. Because, um, well, I don't know what your thoughts on it, but I, th I, I think it is real in terms of the, the benefits of it. Um, and, you know, uh, data or no, or no data, uh, we, we're going to, you know, carrying on this line of, of, of pushing it to people as, as something that would be good for getting yourselves away from the, the stresses of life, basically. Uh, we'll have to wrap it up here then, but let's all thank Ben again for an excellent Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> feel free to have a leaflet. It's got our, our website and email address on there as well. Yeah. Thanks all the time. Thank you.